This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. I am the co host of this program, DeSoto Brown. And we had a little hiatus there for two weeks for Christmas and New Year's. We're now in the new year of 2019. And I just want to acknowledge that I had a decorated uh, holiday season. And I think Rob can show you what I'm talking about. Look at that. Isn't that spectacular? Mm -hmm. Oh, that is a decorated beard for Christmas. Well, let's uh, get away from Christmas. Let's get away from the New Year's frivolities. And let's now welcome the host of this program, Martin Despang, and Martin Despang is joining us from his current position in Germany. But you can't tell, looks like he's right here in Honolulu. And then, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Despang, although it's probably not afternoon for you. It's probably early morning, something like that. It, Martin, sabbatical time, 3 a.m. in the morning oh, that's in cold, terrible. cold Germany. That's but terrible. good to be back, makes me feel warm. Good. to think about our island, so jump right in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to slide so number one. In. Yeah, and this is, uh, you know, I have my personal copy here. This is uh, actually our tropical tourism expert, Suzanne's personal copy that she gave me from the magazine that Timothy Schuller was writing the article of Brutes on the Beach, and it started a really vibrant and vital uh, conversation amongst the three of us, and you had the chance to respond to the article, and this is my turn now, right? Yes. So we've each had a chance. We did a show with Timothy, and then we each are doing a separate show in which we talk about brutalism here in the tropics. Exactly. And if we can get to slide number two, please. Uh, this is the perfect demonstration how if you are ex as excited about this subject matter as we are, it's going to be around you everywhere. For example, in this case, when you fly out of Honolulu, this is the international airport, and you see to my uh, surprise, not to say disappointment, that they're modifying the airport with this very clumsy, chunky, unelegant steel construction probably caused by security paranoia, and I wish they would have listened to our previous show about not to touch the airport as you don't touch Aeroserenum's TWA building in right. New York City, Correct. but remodel it back to the original condition, right. and then whatever you have to add, do outside, or if you have to do here, do in the notion of the architect, which is Osipov here, which you right. live in an Osipov house, by the way. I will soon live in an Osipov house. I'm not there yet, but someday I will be, and that will nah. be a whole new world to deal with. But you grew up in one, I should I correct. I surely you know. did grow up in an Osipov house. That's correct. So let's go to another uh, encounterment with tropical brutalism, slide number three. This was me, and this was my Mahalo Mili Kalikimaka from some local ladies at the district court because Martin supposedly had parked incorrectly and these ladies waived uh, his fee. So I ended up in the district court building. That reminded me a lot of the building that you showed last time at the very bottom right here, Correct. which is the Frank Fazi government building. Correct, right. And both buildings are very stereotomic, are very monolithic. Both their lobbies are kept very open and easy breezy. And actually, in this case, even more than in the Frank Fazi building, which is surprising, as we said yesterday, we were talking about what we're going to say today, because this is a building that has even higher security yeah. demands, right? Correct. So it's very refreshing. But once you go up and you are in these offices, it's a missed opportunity because the building uh, is, you know, potentially, um, you know, able to be biochromatically operated, but people don't take advantage of that and basically hermetically sealed in AC. So our recommendation would be open the buildings up as they were intended to be designed in some right. case. Right. And you right. do have that wonderful shot of looking down the escalator at the open court at the bottom. And that... That is a nice element that hasn't been changed. Surely is. So if we go to slide four quickly, this is just remembering what we talked about, the, you know, at, at least in the show with Tim, which was a little bit more about the surface and um, the sort of aesthetics of tropical brutalism. 
But today, we want to go to slide number five, which is also a permanent background. And I think you brought something to illustrate and demonstrate. Yeah, so let's, uh, Rob, let's go back to the studio here and let me show you what we want to make a, a, a point about with concrete. Concrete is something that will hold on to heat. So if I am putting a flame up to this piece of concrete, the heat is being absorbed into it. And that is the point that Martin wanted to make about his, we can come back to our slide here, about your lanai in the uh, Waikiki Grand. Because the concrete is bombarded by the sun all day, and as the sun goes down, the concrete will start to give off the heat that it accumulated. And that can be a problem. As you said, it's not comfortable sometimes to sit on your lanai, even if the sun is not out, because that concrete is giving off the heat that it already absorbed. Perfectly put to Soto, and that means a little demonstration basically tells us that thermal mass per se and exceptions to the rule as it always is the case, but principally uh, there's, a, there's a no goal for thermal mass in the tropics. So that's a principal problem. However, if we go to the next slide, number six, uh, from the previous show, um, you can modify the concrete. For example, instead of mixing basalt into it, you can mix coral into that. And then you get something that you have a perfect branding name for. Oh, I that. do. You get what we are calling blonde brutalism. And if you look in the lower right corner, there is a beautiful blonde lady for a Pan American poster for the Pan American building. And I, many years ago, got to meet her when she was later on in her life. But she'd been a model in the 1950s here in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. So she's the embodiment of blonde brutalism for this particular moment certainly is. So we're going to talk more about substance today than surface. So number seven um, is uh, the building that until most recently the main tenant was American Savings Bank, who have now moved to a new office building that we promised each other and you now that we're going to do a show about yeah, we it. Do. So this building here, maybe then all things considered that we were just talking about, maybe isn't so exotically tropical because it has an amount of windows, they're pretty flush with the facade, and it also has a lot of concrete that could be overheated by the sun. So are there some more sort of exotic and less invasive uh, uh, tropical brutalist pieces? Yes, there are, and if we go to the next picture here, number eight, the image on the left side shows a glass tower here by Joe Paul Rongstead, who we also want to get on the show and on a uh, talk story at uh, Docomomo. And I paired him with a car in front, the white car. Both get blasted by the sun, are hermetically sealed, so they need fossil fuel to basically operate, right? So we call that uh, an invasive um, approach, while the exotic approach is the one on the right side. So the building that's also on the, in the foreground on the left picture, we could, you can see that these breeze soleils and these slabs are basically shading the amount of glass on the building. And I pair this with my car in front of it, which is when the top is down, uses the trade winds for thermal comfort. So both have an exotic tropical approach, one could say. Mm -hmm. And, and if, I should if, say backed by palm trees to emphasize the tropics. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the smoothest transition to the next <laughs> slide, number nine. Because this is our most, we agree, this is our most iconic piece of tropical brutalism on the island, the central plaza of the Pacific. Going more into detail, however, your analogy and your reference to the palm tree, the building, uh, if you see on the right picture at the very top, um, different than a palm tree that basically gets more intense and more dense and more fluffy the more you go up because that's where the most sun is and the plants need the sun. Um, buildings basically shouldn't open up and shouldn't become more glassy to the top because that's where you overheat. So at the top, the architects unfortunately turned to formalism and didn't stay so much with performative measures as they did on the lower parts of the building, right? Yeah, but it's still a very iconic structure, the Castle and Cook building. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. It doesn't perform as well as it could but it is iconic and is part of that very important financial plaza construction. And I believe that, that's that, the next thing we're going to look at as well. 
We will, and you know, I endorse what you just said, and we continue to try to convince our yeah. CEO and founding uncle Jay Fidel, who we see here talking to a bunch of. Oh yeah, we need to go to the next slide. There we here. go. There we go. Exactly. So, and it also shows, you know, some interesting ground floor features of that composition. And that traces back to one of the most famous um, architects in the landscape area of brutalism, and that's Lawrence Halprin. At the very bottom left of this page here, you can see what used to be what he is very well known for, a water feature. And unfortunately, the client had taken out the water, had put the turf in there. So we urged the client to be aware that they have a Halprin here. And if you have a Halprin you basically conserve it, so please put the water back in. That's what we're telling the clients or the owner or the tenants, whoever. And if we jump to the next page, and this is the encouragement for you to do so. So this is one of the most famous hall print pieces here. This is in Portland, so not that, not that far away. And this is Keller Fountain. And the bottom picture is one that I took when I first ran into it, literally. And it just, like, threw me off because it's a fantastic... Uh, proletarian approach to bring the waterfalls that normal people can't go to because they got to drive for a long while to get into the mountains. And here Halpern brings that sort of natural feature waterfalls into the city with his brutalist uh, public pool, which is amazing. If you haven't seen it, you got to go there. Yeah, and, I, and I can sad. say too, you know, that, that this, these forms are very hard edged concrete and yet the water flowing over them softens them. And that's something that you and I have discussed of the, the use of uh, vegetation to soften and contrast with uh, the hard concrete of the um, brutalist structures. We're gonna be talking, we're gonna see a little bit more of that as we continue through here. Yeah, and why don't we jump to the next page here because it's not authored by Halprin, but very much in the notion of Halprin. This is one of my favorite places in downtown Honolulu here, this little ca uh, canyon here. Uh, approaching again American Savings Banks, at least previously on the left side, you can see here how it has everything that a tropical jungle, a man made jungle needs. It's got shade, it's got wind, it's got water, it's got sun, it's got seeding. And here again, we're checking this out with the emerging generation. Very, very, very fun place to be, and it mm -hmm. shows how alive and, and how less, you know, brutalism is not brutal, it's very gentle, right? Yeah. No, and this is, I agree completely, this is one of my favorite places too, and I think it's really successful. And just as with the fountain we just saw, it starts as a small creek and a small source of water and goes around to the front of the building where it, it expands into a giant pool, which people can sit next to and which is a beautiful feature of Tamarind Square, right where mm -hmm. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if we move on to the next page, why are we continue to do this, getting so uptight and overly excited about tropical brutalism? Because it's endangered. Yeah. And it's also up for being on the register because it takes 50 years to be eligible yeah. to be conserved. Right. And so we're talking 70s and they're coming up actually yeah. this year here for many of these pieces. And unfortunately, some uh, developers take advantage of not quite being 50 years old. And here at the top, we lost what warehouse by Steve Au, which we did a show about. And we have sort of lost, but not really. There's some hope if we could retrofit. Uh, our probably most other most iconic uh, piece of tropical brutalism, which is the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center, which we keep talking about. And I want to you know, so bring back the pictures you showed last time. Right. Next uh, page, please, here, which was until the, you know, the end of the last century, it maintained its original very brave and very sort of ambitious um, design agenda of sort of bringing back what Kalakaua Avenue was at the beginning of the century was a big palm grove and one street being cut through. And in the 70s, the architects wanted to bring this back. And it lasted until, I think you said at the top left, you took this in the early 2000s. Yeah, 2005. Right? And, and, and that is when basically the bling uh, sort of yeah. capitalism and the mercantile typology took over and cut down all the trees and had to put its corporate signs, not just signs on it, but its facades, right? Yeah. Right. They can stick it on cheesecake it, and all these things, which is very unfortunate. So I want to guide you to where this design intention is still noticeable and actually ex to be experienced. And we should go to the next page. This is the backside yeah. of yeah. the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Mall facing 
the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And you can see it still sends the original design intent. There is a jungle in front of this sort of chunky piece of bush hammer concrete. You can see some uh, monkeys in there at the very top <laughs> left doing some maintenance, right? So check this out and imagine how beautiful that was. Very, very sort of intellectually a sophisticated approach that unfortunately didn't survive the predator capitalism of, of bling commerce. But right? I'm really glad that you were able to take these pictures and show that that element still exists on one side of the building, even though it's been lost on the other side that faces the street. Mm -hmm. Our fellow Tropic here, David Rockwood, encouraged us to get off the island at least, well, in my case, physically now, but also <laughs> sort of mentally. So let's jump to number next page, number 16, which is an icon of, of uh, architectural modernism by the architect Ricardo Bofill, who is sort of unfortunately not without his contribution considered to be one of the most postmodern architects. But he started out here again in the heydays of uh, brutalism in the 70s, with his own home and studio moving into a uh, out of out, out of commission cement plant so there's a sort of ruin this concrete industrial ruin that as you said before he used green and vegetation yeah. as the major element to soften it up right. and then inhabit right. it in a very warm and cozy yes. way so it's a great sort of artifact from what led to brutalism in general and sort of, you know, with the vegetation, us having a 12-month growing cycle, potentially, you know, uh, best at our islands than anywhere else in the world. Where is this located? Now, this is in France. Beauville okay. is a French architect, so it's somewhere in France. Okay, because there are France. palm trees growing on it and next to it, so it must be in the south of France, because it, it has be some tropical... Area, yeah, yeah it's got some tropical elements to it. Yeah. So let's go to the next page and make some suggestions how to basically continue the evolution of the tradition of tropical modelism on our island. So this is a project here by a colleague of mine from a while ago at the school uh, I first taught in Bremen in Germany. This is Clemens Bonnen who did a project for a client and he was uh, basically applying uh, at that time fairly new and, and still pretty cutting edge technology which he called ultralight concrete. And what it is that you engineer concrete in a micro porosity sense that it causes trezillions of little, you know, visually almost unnoticeable little air bubbles and infuse them into the into the concrete. So the concrete basically is insulated. So you can build exactly the way we we're used to from tropical brutalism, but it performs better because the concrete doesn't overheat, as you perfectly demonstrated with your, uh, with your lighting uh, uh, little experiment there. Yeah, and you pointed out, way. too, that this is not unlike the traditional Hawaiian halipili, which also doesn't get hot because it is filled with air spaces. The thatching on it is composed of multiple small individual elements with air between them, so you don't build up the thermal mass that then retains heat. Perfect. Perfect building scientist you are by now. Yay! Well. Yay! And 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 moving on to the next one, there's also another way to basically be more tropically appropriate for brutalism, and this is not to use concrete in a in sort of a stereotomic way that we have seen before, chunky way, massy way, but a more light way, a more airy way, a more sort of um, ethereal way, if you want. So so here is uh, one of the last shows here with John and Mayumi Hara, who have shared with us how our School of Architecture building could have been. And they also shared that actually before they got the commission, um, probably, you know, who we consider the master of brutalism in general. And thanks for bringing the book and just having hold up the book. This is about Paul Rudolph. And this is uh, a, um, a book by my former colleague in Arizona at the University of Arizona, Christopher Dolman, who wrote this book about um, uh, uh, pretty much um, here his early phase in life, which he spent in Florida, where he grew up in the in the fellow tropics, and then he transitions slowly but surely to actually the East Coast, the Upper East Coast, and that's where he fully developed to be the master of the more stereotomic. So this building he chose for the cover that we saw when you were holding it up in here on the upper right is sort of in this sort of transitional phase in the early. Mm. 
uh, in the early. And so this is a suggestion. And there's another, if we go to the next page, another uh, example from architectural history by a Swiss uh, architectural firm. They're called FLDA Fives. And they were very early starting in the, we were doing research and finding out in the 50s and, and surely 60s and 70s. And I think ongoing, we were doing very innovative, uh, high density, low rise housing, all concrete, uh, and then softened with vegetation, as one can clearly see here. So moving on to the next page, we have opportunities like that plenty on the island. This is the new construction here on the slide number 20 on Picoy Street, close to Capriani Boulevard. Again, making basically concrete frames, and then we're very disappointed they get hermeticized and fixed glazing gets put on it, and it's all going to be AC. So we wish leave this open, put in the good old glass jealousies, the evolved technically optimized form of them, obviously, and then there you go. And so don't miss out on opportunities that you create. Right, right. right. So the basic structure could be handled differently. You could still build it the same way, but mm -hmm. what you put on the facade and what you face it with could be something different that doesn't necessarily re require tremendous constant use of fossil fuels. Exactly. So me being here, next picture is sort of this sort of deja vu with our own work here. And, you know, when you said, Martin, you know, doesn't your work from the past look somehow brutalist? And I have to say, well, it's a lot of concrete. Yeah. It's a lot of framing. It's a lot of massing. So here we got examples from transportation, from education, from inhabitation. And I have to agree and say, yes, there is sort of a brutalist thinking behind it in a very sort of inclusive and, and in a very social and proletarian way as concrete being a good material, being very durable, and durable, but also being very suitable for, uh, you know, being uh, creating a stage for social event and activities. But how, this is Germany and we're in Hawaii, and so how could we do that in Hawaii? And let's go right. to the next page. And this is, uh, um, Timothy had closed the article referencing me with uh, suggested uh, propositions, polemic propositions for an evolution of tropical brutalism. And what are we looking at on the first slide here? Well, we are looking at some of the projects. We look at three of the projects that Martin has done in his classes at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. This is the first uh, proposed building. It's called Primitivo Number 1. It's a circular building that has a concrete interior core, but then as we've been just discussing, we leave the exterior open so that you've got places for people to congregate who live in the building. You've got the outside coming in. You've got places where there are not only gathering places, but private homes or private spaces as well. And you also are open to the elements, and so you're not heating, you're not cooling, you're just living in a more tropical environment. Mm -hmm. And we move on to the next one, which no surprise is Primitiva 2. Two. Primitiva 2. Now this is a different structure. It's not circular or cylindrical, but it does have an open quality to it. Uh, there's the proposal that in some cases there could be a water curtain wall exterior rather than a solid wall. You, again, are living with plants, you're living with op uh, a sense of being open to the environment. And we've also got those exterior stairs. That's something we've talked about in the past for something mm -hmm. that um, isn't required here. We don't have to include, we don't have to enclose our high-rise stairways, but we can leave them open. So that's another way that we are cutting, getting away from the enclosed hermetic sealed environment. Mm -hmm. And once, while we moved on to the next slide here, as we say, it, just like in a palm grove, you know, there's like a consistency, all the same species, but then each individual plant is different, right? Correct. So based upon that sort of bioclimatic, tropical genetic code, you can grow what we see here on, the, on, on this page, a, a sort of a jungleism system, a grove that most likely, you know, it's material, it's stuff, it's going to be concrete because making a skinny tower probably concrete is the most appropriate material to do so. So we're heading to the end of the show, so let's go to the next slide here, which is that's why we're doing this because then you end up in a fabric that 
It's basically the framework for inhabitation of the natural environment. And it's going to be the birds, and it's going to be the sun, and it's going to be the rain, and it's going to be the people. Right. And all live in happy harmony in their man-made jungle. Yeah. And we want to close the show with the last slide here, which uh, I was so thrilled to see that Tim's article was back-to-back -back with his other article here about promoting a lifestyle. And, and at one point, we're going to do one of our most challenging shows. It's going to be called um, Address Code, Address Code. And it's going to look about skin. It's going to look into skins and how we have a first skin, obviously. The second skin is what we wear. And now we're dressed up, you know, more than we usually do when we're out on the beach, right? Correct. And then the, 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 the building facades are the third skin, and we should be critical about the second and the third skin, yes. as this article points out. Right. Because once, you know, in a jungle, no lion is dressed up, right? They're Correct. dressed up naturally. That's right. And they don't put That's on right. different clothes. No, for they a good do not. Reason. No, they do not. Nature has provided them with all the clothes they need. Exactly. Yes. So I think with this, we're at the end of the show. We're going to see each other again in two weeks. Two we're going to have another show about Harad, Hawaii. Yep. And this time we're going to talk about his design for the West Oahu campus. That's right. That's right. And until then, we hope you all stay as sexy as the beachy brutes. Uh -huh, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Goodbye and thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.